on this Wednesday night. Intense trade talks are underway in Washington as negotiators get ready to work through the night. The Prime Minister sounds optimistic, so does the U.S. President. But with the Friday deadline looming and big obstacles remaining, can they make a deal tonight? We'll take you inside the negotiations, the stakes, and one possible change that could affect how much you pay when you shop online. Also tonight, the Veterans Affairs Minister weighs in on why a murderer is receiving PTSD treatment paid for by his department and who's responsible for the opioid crisis. British Columbia blames the drug makers and is taking Big Pharma to court. But can it win? This is The National. It's a race against the clock in Washington tonight. Negotiators from Canada and the U.S. are trying to do what they haven't been able to do for more than a year, hammer out a new NAFTA deal. Many significant issues still haven't been sorted out and serious sticking points remain. Still, Justin Trudeau seemed positive today. And as Katie Simpson explains, that sense of optimism was even echoed by Donald Trump. Well, thank you very much. It's an Donald honor. Trump yeah. may be known for his yeah, unpredictability, but he embraced a softer tone on trade with Canada, and it's being welcomed by NAFTA negotiators. We have uh, a very good relationship. They came yesterday to the White House, and we negotiated late into the evening. They're in the White House right now. We're negotiating with them right now, and they want to be a part of the deal. And we gave till Friday, and I think we're probably on track. We'll see the Canadians happens, were not yeah. actually at the White House today, but high-level discussions appear to be progressing. The Foreign Affairs Minister met with Trump's trade team for about four hours in total, with negotiators instructed to talk overnight if necessary. Both parties are coming to this stage of the negotiation with a lot of goodwill. A senior source tells CBC News while there is a real commitment to wrap up negotiations by Trump's self-imposed Friday deadline, talks aren't quite there yet. Canada's main concern is the U.S. demand to weaken the dispute settlement system or what's known as Chapter 19. Canada appears prepared to let American farmers sell more dairy products north of the border if the Americans will compromise. No NAFTA deal is better than a bad NAFTA deal. The Prime uh, Minister would not discuss specifics in public, on, uh, but he seemed NAFTA. optimistic. There is a possibility of uh, getting to a good deal for Canada by Friday. Uh, we are standing very firm on uh, a broad range of things. Justin Trudeau will update Canadian premiers tomorrow on the state of talks in a conference call. Christian Freeland will do the same with her NAFTA council too. After a year of negotiations, it appears all sides may be ready to finally get to a yes. In the end, for Donald Trump, there has to be a way for him to say, I won. And for us to make it acceptable, we have to be able to say we didn't lose. And if we reach that sort of sweet spot, well, then there may be a deal to be made by Friday. And our Katie Simpson is still in Washington on NAFTA Watch for us. Okay, Katie, uh, Canada's been away from the negotiating table for five weeks, only came back uh, to sit down yesterday. Is getting to a win something that's possible here? Well, to build on what former Premier Sheree just said, Trump can point to improved labor standards in Mexico as a win. And if Canada gives American farmers more access to the Canadian dairy market, that would be a win for the U.S. too. If Canada can get out with a dispute resolution system and supply management intact, that wouldn't be a loss. OK, you mentioned the Prime Minister, Christia Freeland. They're going to hold some private NAFTA briefings tomorrow. What should we read from that? What else can we expect? It's important to note the Prime Minister's office wants people to know about the Premier's briefing, suggesting it might have something positive to discuss privately. So that's a subtle hint we picked up on. But those high-level talks between Christa Freeland and her American counterparts, they are expected to keep going right on through till tomorrow. Okay. And you'll be there right until this thing gets wrapped up or not. Katie Simpson in Washington, thank you. Thanks. Canada also scored a big trade victory today. It has to do with stiff penalties levied by the Trump administration all the way back in January on newsprint from this country. A U.S. trade tribunal overturned that decision and said, no, uh, you shouldn't be imposing tariffs on uh, Canadian forestry workers. So this is really good news, but it's also something that we've been working very, very hard for. 
The U.S. slapped tariffs of up to 32 percent, claiming Canadian paper products hurt the American industry. The Independent Tribunal found that to be false and so scrapped the duties. And it's that kind of trade action that Trudeau points to as proof that Canada needs to preserve the so-called dispute settlement mechanism that's in NAFTA. You'll be hearing a lot about it. So what does that mean and why is it such a big sticking point? It's commonly known as Chapter 19 of NAFTA, and it's meant to solve disputes between trading partners. But the Trump administration wants rid of it altogether. For Canada, it is a line in the sand. So why so important to one country and not the other? Just as good fences make good neighbors, good dispute settlement systems make good trading partners. If the United States decides to impose duties on a Canadian product, Canada can push back and turn to a neutral panel of arbiters to assess whether the duties are actually legal, instead of relying on American courts to make decisions. Canada has turned to Chapter 19 dozens of times and won, most recently about softwood lumber. But some Americans consider this kind of dispute resolution to be a potential threat to their sovereignty, including the U.S. Trade Representative. Why should a foreign national be able to come in and not have the rights of Americans in the American court system, but have more rights than Americans have in the American court system? Getting rid of such a measure could mean duties are just imposed and counter duties become the response and a trade war follows. At least one American study points out that Chapter 19 might work because Canada, the U.S. and Mexico have actually taken less trade action against one another than other non-NAFTA countries. OK, here's another bit of NAFTA lingo if you're playing at home that you might not know. The de minimis threshold. So what is it? Well, it's the maximum value of online and mail order goods that you can import. If you're shopping online, for instance, below 20 bucks, you're laughing. Above that, you're going to get walloped with duties and taxes. And that number hasn't actually budged since 1985, before all that online shopping you're doing. Salima Shivji has the pros and cons of increasing it. This is an area we do a lot of work in over here. At this shipping warehouse just across the Canada-U.S. border... Here's another bicycle. Crow Smith checks packages for thousands of Canadian customers who shop online but ship to the U.S. In a lot of cases, if merchandise is made in the United States or in Mexico, there's no duties or anything and they don't need a broker. And the savings really become significant. That is, if you successfully sneak your shopping across the border. People living in Canada, coming into the United States, and smuggling things back into Canada because the tariffs are so massive. No, we're treated horribly. It could get a lot easier for consumers if there's a change to Canada's de minimis threshold, allowing you to order more from American online sites without paying duty. Mexico just raised its limit to ink this week's trade deal. Washington is pushing Canada to do the same. <laughs> Many Canadians think the $20 limit is sorely out of date. Canada has one of the lowest thresholds in the developed world. I think it's time that we all acknowledge that we're in a global economy um, and Canadian consumers should be able to participate, participate in that global economy. Very nice. But for many retailers, any talk of raising the de minimis level is a real threat. It would hurt. I mean, you, th it doesn't make a lot of sense to give an advantage to uh, a U.S. retailer when Canadian retailers are investing in their bricks and mortar and their online businesses here. He says jobs are at stake. But trade analysts say raising the limit could also be an easy concession for Canada, giving it one more chip to play at the bargaining table. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Toronto. Here's what else we're working on tonight on The National. Outrage from veterans across the country after CBC reported the government is paying for a convicted killer's PTSD treatment. Now the Minister of Veterans Affairs weighs in. Plus, with legal pot on the horizon, how to make sure your kids aren't the ones suffering from side effects. But first, British Columbia is taking a stand against opioids and the companies pushing them. The opioid crisis across North America is now beyond severe, as BC well knows. And the cost has been astronomical. Dozens of U.S. states have already sued one of the major opioid makers to claw some of those costs back. And as our Renee Filipponi reports, today, British Columbia took legal aim at more than 40 companies it wants to hold responsible. 
This is a long overdue action uh, for government to take. It's a first in Canada, a provincial government taking the makers of opioids to court. Pharmaceutical companies must take responsibility for their role and put the lives of people before profit. From addictions treatment to emergency response, the costs to the healthcare system are substantial. BC wants to be compensated, but won't give an exact figure. We can't yet know precisely the financial costs incurred by British Columbia as a result of the actions of these firms. The costs are rising every day. BC is basing its case on a 2007 court settlement in West Virginia. In it, drug manufacturer Purdue admitted to misbranding OxyContin with the intent to defraud or mislead. The province says if the BC Supreme Court certifies this class action, they will be asking other provinces and territories to join in the fight, and they likely will. New Brunswick has already voiced interest in taking the pharmaceutical industry to court over the opioid crisis. In a statement today, Purdue Pharma Canada, one of the 40 companies named in the suit, says it has always marketed its products in line with Health Canada standards. Critics say this move will do little to curb the current crisis. Do you want to go to the hospital and get checked out? We see it as a sideshow to the main event. The main event is a toxic, illegal drug market that is killing four British Columbians a day, and that's the problem that needs to be addressed with all of the efforts we can muster. That's him, like playing at the beach. For these parents, the reality of addiction is too real. Their son, 16-year-old Elliot Erchuk, was injured in sports and required multiple surgeries. He was given prescriptions to deal with the pain. We believe that's the point at which Elliot became uh, uh, dependent upon opiates. When his dose was cut back, Elliot turned to the streets for drugs and died from a fentanyl overdose this past April. Today's action's a step in the right direction. It's overdue, but better late than never. Um, it's urgent, but it's a step. One step in BC's battle against the opioid crisis. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. So how long might this battle be? Well, considering the long, drawn-out fight, it's still locked in, B.C. is, with another powerful industry. This could be a case of hurry up and wait. B.C. sued tobacco companies for damages all the way back in 1998, the first Canadian province to do so. But 20 years later, they're still going in circles. The companies have dragged it out by launching a constitutional challenge, arguing that their parent companies should be excluded from lawsuits and even seeking access to databases containing information on every person in B.C. who has received health care benefits, all of which were rejected. But the overall result speaks for itself. You can't lose if the case never ends. Still, Attorney General David Eby believes this new fight against Big Pharma is different. We've taken the learnings from the tobacco litigation, uh, and they are significant, and applied them to this because there are a lot of similarities between the two. Meanwhile, the legalization date for another drug is fast approaching. Come October 17th, Canadians will be free to use recreational cannabis. But there are still many tricky issues to sort out. Tonight, our Katie Nicholson looks at a big one that's about as close to home as you can get. Walk into Tokyo Smoke, and the only thing that will get you buzzed is the coffee. For now. But like other cannabis shops, it also sells things to help you enjoy the not-yet-legal pot products. It's also selling parents who use peace of mind. So I have a one-and-a-half-year-old. He's just starting to, like, explore drawers, getting into things. Love That's one of the reasons the store sells these locking leather bags. So there is honestly no way for someone, a little kid with little fingers, to break into this. But elsewhere in Ontario, little fingers are getting into their parents' stash, and that's causing problems. Good search term is bad parent. Really? Because parents often, I'm such a bad parent, I had to call the poison center. Heather Hudson is with Ontario Poison Control, and she says one product in particular keeps coming up. So edibles are a real concern for us. They're in the form of candies and, and gummies and cookies and brownies, and, and that's enticing to anybody, uh, certainly to a young child who doesn't know any better. And then there's teens who perhaps should know better. Health Canada says cannabis use in teens can put some at risk of developing mental illness and possible addiction later in life. That's why Dr. Joanna Henderson says parents need to start having open-ended, non-judgmental talks with their kids. One of the pitfalls that happens with parents is that they often go into the conversation 
wanting to tell their young person all of the bad things about whatever risk behavior it is, and in this case, cannabis use. And she says that just doesn't work. Over at Tokyo Smoke, Jenny Stengel has this advice to parents. Similar to how you would talk uh, to your children about alcohol, I think having that open dialogue, I think um, just providing them with the information around cannabis, around the negatives, the positives. And if that doesn't work... Zip it up, lock it, and it is safe, safe and sound from... There's always the lock and key to keep little and teen-sized fingers out of their parents' stash and hopefully out of emergency rooms. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Now, back when the plan to legalize was first announced, there was big public concern over safety and education, especially from parents. And as that doctor pointed out, communication is key, something Nova Scotia seems to have taken to heart with the release of a special kit to help parents through the transition. The kit's pretty straight up about the health risks and legal consequences of misusing weed. And it has page after page of advice for parents on how to talk to their kids about it. So some strong cautions in there. But what's striking is the calm, even-handed tone. It's informative without being dire. Heck, the whole awareness campaign even has its funny moments. Are you okay to drive? What do you know about pot? Like, have you ever tried it? And it all fits into the federal government's tone, too. It's ad, pretty family-friendly. Store cannabis securely and away from kids. And don't travel internationally. A story we first told you about last night is getting a lot of reaction again today. A man who got post-traumatic stress disorder after murdering a woman is getting treatment paid for by Veterans Affairs, even though he never served a day in the military. Today, there's growing anger amongst veterans. But as Tom Murphy reports, officials at Veterans Affairs are defending the policy. With his medals on the wall and his years of service long behind him, Fred Rideout, veteran, PTSD survivor since 2009, is angry. How the heck can someone that just got convicted of murder be given Veterans Affairs benefits? So he just had to ask Veterans Affairs why. Why does Christopher Garnier, who killed an off-duty police officer and rolled her body through town in a green bin, get to have Veterans Affairs pay for treatment for PTSD he acquired as a result of committing the murder, just because his father is a veteran? Police stay on the line for the next available analyst. Rideout waits patiently for his answer. Meanwhile, at the top, the chief psychiatrist for Veterans Affairs has been doing her best to explain, defend its policy to the media, never commenting on the specifics of this case. We provide care to family members, to spouses, um, when we know that it's in the benefit of the well-being of the veteran. As he waits, Rideout's list of questions grows. Surely, he asks himself, prisons have their own psychiatrists and psychologists. Do they really need to use veterans' funding at all? Veterans Affairs, how can I help you? Yes, veterans day. Affairs Rideout insists calling. if vets ask for help for their family, they too could get it. In the course of this call, Rideout learns for the first time that his family has also been eligible for the same funding Garnier is receiving. And yet... A benefit that's given to a convicted murder uh, is now all of a sudden opening up opportunities that I never received from my initial diagnosis. And here it is almost 10 years later. I am very sorry that this was not made um, available to you. And the angst around the whole situation <sighs> remains. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Halifax. The Minister of Veterans Affairs says that even in the past few days, more veterans and their families have been connected with mental health supports. But he also says he understands people's frustrations. I think I reacted like most Canadians reacted. How could this happen? How could this happen? Um, and so we are going to look into how and why this decision was made. Let's get you up to speed on some of the other stories we are tracking tonight. Starting in Montreal, where a powerful storm has hammered the city. 
Crews are still cleaning up after some serious weather. Check out this scene in one neighborhood. The wind was so powerful, it peeled a roof right off a building. Elsewhere, trees were toppled, power lines torn down. At one point, more than 100,000 homes and businesses were in the dark. But hydro crews say they are making progress in getting power back online. And in BC today, a sobering milestone. Wildfires have now consumed so much of the province that in that regard, this is now the worst season on record. So far, nearly 13,000 square kilometers have been scorched. To give you a sense of how big that is, it's about double the size of the greater Toronto area. And the situation is still so volatile that today officials decided to extend the provincial state of emergency. Still ahead tonight on The National, hundreds of thousands of people mobilized in the wake of the Parkland school shooting. So we'll revisit students in Baltimore who are more than familiar with that kind of violence and want to know, what about us? Plus, the U.S. Open is feeling the heat, and not just because of how hot it is in New York. Why the tournament is being called sexist is our moment of the day. Mm -hmm. And the British and French battle it out on international waters all over scallops. England and France, allies for two centuries, but a battle has been brewing. The French accuse the English of invading the coast of Normandy to scoop up scallops here. Now, as Thomas Degler shows us, it's actually led to an ugly confrontation. A wild scene at sea. British and French fishing boats in a showdown. Like a dangerous game of bumper cars. Just watch that smaller boat caught in the middle. And all this over scallops. We had around 10, maybe 15 other French boats surrounding us, throwing rocks at us, flares. The French Navy were there on site and never done a thing. The British are allowed to fish off the coast of Normandy year round, but the French face domestic rules and can only catch scallops from October to May. If we let them, they'll ravage the whole sector, he says. So this week, some French fishermen surrounded the British vessels and took out their anger on them. A clash on the English Channel the site of real wars for centuries. We should have had a Royal Navy fisheries protection vessel on standby. You know, there was a possibility of people getting injured, uh, possibly even killed, uh, because of the actions of the, of the French fishermen. I'm not exaggerating with that. The rocks thrown on board and the broken glass highlight the suddenly real danger. As for that small French vessel banged up earlier, today investigators got a close look. It's not the only boat back in port now needing repairs. Le Kevin requires weeks of work to be seaworthy again. The boat's owner, though, says he's ready to keep fighting for his rights. As Britain leaves the EU, it faces the prospect of restricted fishing zones and maybe more showdowns at sea. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. And still ahead on The National, a movement to make sure food doesn't go to waste. So this was for sale everywhere. Mm -hmm. This is rescued. All this food and everything that I deal with is rescue food. Tonight on The National, some wild video of an alleged road rage incident north of Toronto. That's a man clinging to the hood of a car, traveling on a major highway, at times going up to 100 kilometers an hour. He told CBC News it all started when he refused to let another driver merge in front of him. He jumped in front of me and slammed on his brakes. So, uh, yeah, and I thought it was over after that. Yeah, but it wasn't. Further up the highway, he says he was confronted again. The other driver reportedly got in front of him and slammed on his brakes, forcing him to stop. He says he eventually got out of his car to take a photo of the other man's license plate. That's when the other driver then sped up and he ended up on the hood. Now, somehow he wasn't hurt after all that. And as you might imagine, police are now investigating. 
having a person on the hood of your vehicle and you're going down the highway at highway speed is nothing short of the most extreme type of aggressive driving I've ever seen. Police want to talk with witnesses and they're also trying to track down the driver. They say they want to hear his side of the story before exploring any possible charges. I think part of the North Korean problem is caused by our uh, trade disputes with China, but China's having a very, very tough time. The U.S. president today blaming China for stalled nuclear talks with Pyongyang. It's not anything he hasn't suggested before, but these latest comments come just days after Trump called off a planned trip to North Korea by his top diplomat. Now, Trump continues to insist negotiations are doing well, but he warned on Twitter that if North Korea talks continue to stall out, he might restart joint military exercises with South Korea and Japan and threaten that they'd be, quote, far bigger than ever before. If you love shoes, this may come as bad news to you. Town Shoes is shutting down. The U.S. company that owns the stores, DSW Incorporated, said it had poor sales and competition was too stiff. So all 38 stores across the country will be closed by January, which will affect about 400 employees. But DSW says it hopes to find them work at its other brands. That's his second serve. Yeah, he's at match point. Could be in, and there it is. Shapovalov drops to his knees. Yeah, another victory for Canadian tennis player Denis Shapovalov at the U.S. Open. Tonight, he beat Italy's Andreas Seppi. It was a marathon match in sweltering heat, lasting three hours and 47 minutes. Shapovalov's next match at the tournament is expected to be another rough one, though. He faces Wimbledon finalist Kevin Anderson on Friday. Food waste is a big problem around the world. 1.3 billion tons big. That's how much gets thrown out each year. And in Canada, the average person tosses about 170 kilograms of food annually. It's a real problem that's bad for the environment. And think of the millions of people who go hungry around the world. It's all got Canadian entrepreneurs thinking. And Diane Buckner caught up with a few of them to see how they hope to keep all that food out of landfills. Okay, it's gonna take a while to heat up. Chef Jagger Gordon hates the thought of people going hungry. It smells delicious. With a thriving catering business, he's almost always surrounded by food. So he was shocked years ago when his young daughter came home from a sleepover and told him there had been no breakfast for anyone. I always thought there was enough food for everyone. Why would, why would someone not have food in their fridge in the morning? The realization that poverty and hunger were so close to home like while this. also seeing the incredible amount of food that goes to waste in his industry turned this caterer into a crusader. We are feeding thousands of people a week and diverting tens of thousands of pounds a week of, of perfectly edible food that's decimal landfills. His mission is to feed it forward with a number of projects like this grocery store. The food here is practically free. And people just pay what they can? Yeah, it's more like donate what you can. The workers are volunteers, the food donated by retailers. Looks perfect, but it didn't sell fast enough and is no longer considered fresh enough for fussy consumers. This would have been sold somewhere else, most of this stuff? So this was for sale everywhere. Mm -hmm. This is rescued. All this food and everything that I deal with is rescue food. Rescued from the garbage heap. $31 billion worth a year, just in Canada. Food goes to waste on the farm, in transit, in processing plants, in restaurants, and in our homes. Now, that's changing. Last 20 years, our team has been focused on extracting waste from the supply chain. Efficiency expert Martin Gooch did the research that came up with that $31 billion figure. And this project is the first of its type in the world. Today he's telling a group of farmers about his newest project that will highlight where exactly waste occurs and how much it costs business. We have this perception of affluence and abundance. We can afford, most of us can afford to waste some food, whether we're an individual consumer or whether we're a business. Hi, Lloyd. Hi, Good nice to see, to see you. you. His project is being funded by Second Harvest, a social agency that distributed over 10 million pounds of surplus food last year. We know that there is so much more food that we are not accessing. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we're doing this research, is to find out, OK, where is this food? Every morning, a team delivers truckloads of unsold food donated by big grocers. 
But what we found was there was a lot of places that were smaller in scale that we weren't going to pick up from because we wouldn't send a truck there, it just wasn't efficient. So we created something called foodrescue.ca. It's a web-based platform. I kind of call it the eHarmony of food. The site matches smaller donors and those in need. A great idea, but still, as a society, we toss far too much food, and that contributes to global warming. Rotting food creates methane, a pollutant even worse than carbon dioxide. That's what inspired this young company. So this is the regular box that gets delivered weekly in Toronto and London. It has basically uh, produce that farmers can't sell to grocery stores and they usually end up to throwing away in the garbage. Cedric Samaha uh, yeah. is with Flash Food, a startup that offers home delivery of less than perfect vegetables, rejected by grocers. For example, this potato, it's disfigured. I feel like I've bought potatoes like that yeah, at the exactly. store before. That's not that uh, radical. Yeah, this, most of them don't have a lot of issues. Like the cucumber, the size sometimes is an issue, so they won't send it through. Um, that looks perfect, too. Yeah. Flash food is growing, thanks to demand from customers like John Griffiths and Michelle Clark. Having a box delivered, which is food, that would normally go to waste because it doesn't look perfect, is, is great. The service doesn't save them any money, but the home delivery is convenient and they believe less waste will slow climate change. This summer's been so hot that um, it's going to get worse. Back with chef Jagger Gordon, he's taking his feed it forward idea to a new level. He's come up with an app that will allow anyone to share their extra food. You just take a picture of the product that you want to donate, any food item that's still edible in good standing. So a piece of pizza or even a truckload of tomatoes, you just take a picture of it. It uploads to a map so that whoever wants it can come get it. But the great thing is, is every city can now be in competition of how, who is saving how much oh. food from the landfills and how much food is actually being given back to people in need. So you're going to try and start that competition? I it's starting. The app launches into the marketplace next month, and many would say none too soon. It's time to get on board what's being called a global food waste revolution. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Now, Europe has been ahead of the game when it comes to legislation around food waste. In 2016, France became the first country in the world to ban supermarkets from throwing away or destroying unsold food. The big retailers now have to donate those goods to food banks and charities or else face heavy fines. Italy followed suit, offering incentives to businesses who donate food to charities. It's also cleared some of the hurdles around donating food that's just past its expiry date. That was a big concern for health and liability reasons. I would have eaten all those potatoes. I don't know what was wrong with them. Still ahead on The National, Paul Hunter takes us into a school in Baltimore where students deal with gun violence on a daily basis. So why don't they get the same attention the Parkland school shooting did? How many kids in this school have been shot and killed in the last year or so? Eight total. Eight? Eight, yep. We've lost eight students to gun violence. After her daughter was killed in the Parkland school shooting last February, Lori Aladuff became an outspoken advocate for change, demanding better safety for children and teachers at every school. Now she herself is in a position to make that happen, having just won a seat on the school board. In order for me to make change and make sure it happens, I need to have a seat at the table and have a vote. And, and I'm so excited to have one, to be the next school board member, to be able to make sure what happened to my daughter doesn't happen to any other children. Parkland got a lot of attention this year, but it doesn't represent the whole picture. In some communities, gun violence is almost a daily occurrence. It follows kids from their classrooms to their homes and many places in between. Paul Hunter visited a school in Baltimore earlier this year and spoke to students whose stories you don't often hear. Just for a moment, forget about Parkland, Florida, the home, for now, of America's gun control debate. This is Baltimore home to more gun killings last year per capita than any other big city in the country. On average, almost one per day. 
balloon memorials mark where the dead fell, and there are lots of them. And so as Americans talk yet again of gun control, not least how to protect its young people, consider this school, XL Academy. I wanted you to read to yourself about um, disease control. Disease Where control. students who've struggled in other schools come seeking a second chance, a place that isn't in the headlines much and that didn't spark a march on Washington, even though it has its own sobering death count. How many kids in this school have been shot and killed in the last year or so? Eight total. Eight? Eight. Yep, we've lost eight students to gun violence. How do you feel about that? I'm overwhelmed, um, sometimes just tired. You don't imagine as a principal this is part of your job, but it is. To be clear, none of the eight students were killed on school property. It was all out on the streets. Let's go, ladies who are waiting for me in my conference room. Everybody else, let's go. But as they gather for class on a week, yet another student from this school had been shot and wounded. Fear mixes with resignation, frustration with resentment. How many people here know somebody who's been shot? Raise your hand. Three students who face not only that, but headlines these days that convince them no one's calling for tougher gun laws in their name. But a black person gets shot, do they do anything about it? No. Do, did the part when somebody got shot here, did Parkland come say something to us? No. Did we have a march? No. Baltimore doesn't get a voice all that big because, of it, because the city is predominantly black. So since the city is predominantly black, they don't they're not going to pay any attention to it. It's like they just don't care about black people. Yeah, I don't think they care about black people either. They, they might say they do, but your actions speak louder than your words. As we spoke, Michaela Gray's boyfriend was in hospital. It was he who'd been shot this week, just before school, two days earlier. It barely made the news. Now people is getting killed in daylight. Not just at night, like in daylight. It don't matter where you at. You don't have to be involved in anything, any gang violence, any drugs, and still get killed. Do you hear gunshots? Oh, yeah. Frequently. Frequently. Um, but th that's, that's a part of the culture that's been accepted. For Munir Bihar, that's the problem, the culture of right. violence it's, it's, it's in Baltimore. He of, himself grew up in it, read, in and out of jail news, in his teens. He turned his life news. around. Now he wants to change Baltimore and all that's of those who say normal. it can't be done. There's a funeral almost every damn day of a young black man in this city killed by the hands of an another young black man. That's not normal. I just refuse to accept that as normal. I refuse to just live my life and like, oh, it's all right, brothers die. It's a part of life. Oh, it happens. It's the hood. No, nah. that's, that's not real, and I refuse to accept it. Who would like to challenge themselves? Raise your hand, please. Come on up, Wayne. Come on up, little man. His response, the gun problem up, is King. fixable up, from please. the bottom up. One, two. Munir started Three, a program aimed at helping four, kids steer clear five. of violence. Yeah, my man got some strong legs. In a One city where so, so many gun deaths Damn. are within the black community. I want to see a young, successful man. He That's teaches discipline, focus, right respect, with the view successful. turning kids into better people will Productive. achieve far more than merely Husband, protesting father. for tougher gun laws. Health, education, literacy, mental health, recreation, if we're not doing this, but we're just demanding that things change without the ingredients of the change, I think that's just an absence of logic. People have died so that you have an opportunity to show your brilliance. You know when you're doing wrong, but you also know when you're doing right. The vast majority of young black men dying by guns in America are not being uh, killed. They're not dying by AR-15s. So ban AR-15s, cool. It changes nothing in terms of the problem of homicides in the black community.
As it stands, the shootings here effectively never stop. So, up the steps and into the home of yet another family stung by gun violence, community workers Walker Gladden and Clayton Guyton. I want to start with uh, how your week was. Let me start. Don't matter. On this night, it's to meet with Keandre Greenwich. He was shot last year, one day after school. Says Keandre, guns are simply a fact of his world. He's 14 years old. That thing ain't gonna never end. You talking about gun violence? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's one thing that's going to stay forever. Is it that bad? Like, that's, that's normal? Wrong with me. Right now, the sense of urgency is so great. Uh, immediate response is so great that I don't have time to really wait. We got to move now. You know, we dying. We got to move. You know, our young people are dying. Our community is deteriorating. You know, I like to see his face from time to time. Walker's so, own really son is among them, feel, shot uh, dead in 2016. That's him on the pendant. All those anti-gun demonstrations, they say, it's mostly people from a different America pointing to the country's lingering racial divide on why the gun problems in mostly black Baltimore seem to get so little national attention. Our change is still not here yet because it's so difficult. But see, we up for it. So no, we're not mad with them because, uh, and we're not really upset with them because we know, hey, it's easy for you. You can't stand up for the problems in our community without somebody looking at you and saying, you're an angry black man. We're still going in the back door. That's where we're at. So what is the way forward in a city with so many gun deaths week after week? You can march all you want. You can march every day for hours asking for justice and for your voice to be heard. But if the people in the city not changing, then the violence isn't going to stop. I pray that something will change, but then, like I said, maybe it won't. A blunt assessment by those not yet ready to believe anyone outside the city's even listening. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Baltimore. Just to put that anxiety that the students feel into context, consider this for a minute. Back in February, Baltimore made national headlines after it went 11 days without a single homicide. That was the city's longest streak in several years. And it all started when a community group called for a ceasefire. Still ahead on The National. Her shirt was on backwards, so she changed it. What she didn't expect was to get a warning for it. I'm not sure. She just realized that. She's oh, only okay. Just well, let's change right here. <laughs> How this brief moment at the U.S. Open sparked a larger discussion about sexism in tennis. That is our moment of the day. Next. It's the dog days of summer, and in New York, where the U.S. Open is taking place, temperatures are scorching, and the humidity overbearing. Many of the male players have been going shirtless between sets to stay cool. But when a female player briefly took off her top yesterday, she was told she was breaking the rules. It prompted an apology today from tournament organizers who were no doubt feeling the heat over accusations of a sexist double standard. And that's our moment of the day. She just realized that. She's oh, OK, just well, let's change right here. <laughs> So, France's Alizé Cornet had just returned from changing clothes during a heat-mandated break when she realized her shirt was on backwards. She had a sports bra on underneath, so she quickly took off her top and put it back on the right way. The whole thing only took about 10 seconds, but right after, to her surprise, the chair umpire gave her a warning. So, what was the issue? Well, according to the Grand Slam rulebook, women should only change their attire in a break between sets in the nearest available locker room. But critics online, like the mother of Andy Murray, were quick to point out that male players take off their shirts all the time without being punished. Novak Djokovic, for example, took his shirt off for several minutes yesterday while cooling off. The U.S. Tennis Association responded today, saying it regrets this was handled as a code violation and has now clarified its policy, noting that 
all players can change their shirts when sitting in the player chair. And of course, the bigger picture here is that this isn't the first misstep of its kind in the tennis world. Serena Williams, uh, when she came back from maternity leave, there was the controversy around her ranking and how that affected the, her seating in tournaments, people in effect saying she was punished for going on mat leave. Uh, her cat suit, which is uh, quite a striking thing in and of itself, uh, tennis officials famously wanted to ban that mm -hmm. uh, for the future. And so she wore a tutu, which was uh, striking in its own right. And, and surprise, surprise, she won when she played that game. I have many things to say about this, probably longer than we have for this exact moment tonight. <laughs> but I'll use Billie Jean King's response that she said on Twitter, of course, the tennis icon, she said on Twitter that the policing of women's bodies must end. It's about tennis, not what they're wearing. I'm dead now. That's the National for August 29th. Good night. <laughs> Good night.